Good afternoon. I'm really excited for our closing lecture, um, which is the um, uh, is going to be given by Mary Jane Logan McCallum. Before I introduce Mary Jane, I want to acknowledge our sponsors formally, um, all the institutional sponsors that have made it possible for us to be together today. Native American and Indigenous Studies Initiative at Princeton, Land, Language and Art, a Humanities Council Global Initiative at Princeton, Princeton University Library, and the School of Historical Studies here at IAS. Uh, my colleague, Miles, um, said a few words about the school yesterday morning, but I just want to say how appreciative I am of how colleagues within the school have been supportive and enthusiastic about the connections with Lenape tribal nations and community members. And I want to acknowledge the Dr. S. T. Lee Fund for Historical Studies that helped us to be able to bring everybody together today. I especially, though, want to acknowledge the people who have contributed so much to organizing what we've done together. Uh, above all, the language keepers who organized our plans for what would be good to have on the program. Ian, Kristen, Velma, Rel, and also those who weren't able to be here in person today, Molly and Nicole. At IAS, I want to express a lot of gratitude to Gabriella, who many of you have encountered, Janet Yoon, Meredith Lozier and her team, and Dario Mastriani and his team, especially Dane, who has been working all day long on Saturday um, supporting the AV. And um, now let me introduce to you Mary Jane McCall. She's a professor of history at the University of Winnipeg and the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous People, History and Archives. Um, she's published uh, abundantly, and I want to particularly single out her book, Nin Dalok, I Work, Boys and Girls Work at Mount Elgin Industrial School, 1890 to 1915, which came out just last year. The book is by Mary Jane, but it also takes pains to acknowledge all those who contributed to making that book possible. In particular, the translations that were produced by the Muncie Delaware Language and History Group and the foreword written by Julie Tucker. I'm gonna read just a sentence that describes the book. This book takes its title from the phrase for I work in Lenape, the traditional language of Muncie Delaware people, and was inspired by the work of the Muncie Delaware Language and History Group. Written for the descendants and communities of children who attended Mount Elgin and intended as a resource for all Canadians, Nin Dalok tells the story of student life at Mount Elgin Industrial School between 1890 and 1915. The first half of the book focuses on boys' work, including maintenance and farm labor, the second on girls' work, including cooking, cleaning, and laundry. There's also an audiobook of Nindalok and also an exhibition at Art Windsor Essex, an exhibition curated by Julie Ray Tucker, um, also called Nindalok, which brings together existing works and new commissions by First Nation artists. So it's a beautiful expression of survivance and creativity and persistence and beauty in the face of all the the horror of residential schools. Mary Jane is also the author of a number of other works, many articles, but I want to just single out a couple of her works. She's also published in 2014, Indigenous Women, Work and History, 1940 to 1980, and also Twice as Good, A History of Aboriginal Nurses, which came out in 2007. Please join me in welcoming Mary Jane Logan McCallum. Okay. Um, Anishik, uh, Suzanne. Nin uh, Dishinzi, Mary Jane Logan McCallum. Nin Onji Nalahi Shok Wiki in Winnipeg. Nin Dalanape, we now will Otaman Wendak Takwach. I'm a second language learner, and I'm able to do this introduction because Muncie people have committed to language reclamation and revitalization and teaching. And we're all so thankful for their work and um, we try our best to support them. I'm gonna repeat a lot of what Suzanne just said. Uh, this is the plenary for the third annual Muncie Language and History Symposium. This symposium has been the result of a lot of behind the scenes work on the part of many people. And I wanna acknowledge um, Dr. Suzanne, Anu and Catalina, um, also Melissa Morton, and that these the funds for this lecture were raised from the Dr. S. T. Lee Fund for Historical Studies. Uh, also want to say thank you to the Native American and Indigenous Studies Initiative at Princeton 
the Land, Language, and Art, a Humanities Council Global Initiative, Princeton University Libraries, and the School of Historical Studies um, at the, advanced, uh, the um, Institute for Advanced Study. And especially all of those who participated and presented over the last few days. Okay, uh, I want to do a couple of different things. I want to just talk about method first, um, because I, I'm kind of immersed in it right now. So as well as a place for gathering socially and for recollecting language and, and histories, this uh, symposium is also a relationship building symposium with a goal to connect members of the IAS and Princeton to Lenape speaking uh, people and communities in the broader support for language and history learning. So it's a meeting where we can share our work, but it's also a meeting that's a method in and of itself for research. So this kind of meeting is at the heart of the kind of historical methodology that the Muncie Delaware Language and History Group does at Muncie. So practicing this method of history research uh, has many benefits. We can learn directly from people with specific knowledge and skills that don't exist elsewhere. Uh, we're kind and encouraging uh, to each other. Uh, we return to the same questions over and over, which um, builds a conversation over time. Um, we're creating a history that's directly responsible to Muncie people as well, and to the Muncie Delaware nation for me. And I think that this creates a certain honesty and humility and thoughtfulness that I sometimes don't see in professional history circles in Canada. Uh, one of the things that I picked up from Mark Peters' lectures was about uh, the integrity and honor in um, Muncie and Delaware people's dealings uh, with others. And so I try to think about that also when I'm learning and teaching um, the past. So there's many advantages to doing history this way. So having this kind of exchange and relationship and be actually a part of the procedures that we take in our method of, of research. Um, it can also be very intense. Um, as a professional historian, I'm used to thinking about discrete time periods. Uh, for me, I'm very comfortable with the 20th century little like up to maybe 1880, uh, 1870, I could probably squish it to 1850. But before that, I'm really uh, uncertain. And um, there's a way there's a facility of talking about uh, kind of pre pre contact or what's called prehistory in my field, and contemporary, very close together. And so it's, uh, it's a different way of thinking for me. Uh, we have been brought together uh, here by a medievalist. Um, no one here finds that unusual or out of place. Um, and we regularly move between worlds that are commonly classified, right, as prehistory or pre-industrial my field. And our, their, our survival through those uh, eras, I guess, is not surprising or fascinating, but it's a premise. It's the premise of us. So um, that changes everything, really, when you're doing history. And for people who come to understand this about Muncie history, once you have that, you don't go back. You can't see things a different way. Uh, so in that context, many things come to you at once. And so it's hard to maintain and describe what might be called a focus or a center, um, apart from the people who are actually surrounding you at the time. So what happens to me in this method is that I, I, I tend to write or want to write four or five different histories at once and have different subjects and topics in my mind. And they move in and out um, of each other and uh, away from each other. And I have questions in my head for other people while I'm doing history and reading history. I wonder what Ian would think about this when I'm thinking about it, for example. Um, and I wonder if my cousin knows about something. I wonder if I send her an image that might help her or, you know, she might laugh or something. And so in writing and presenting uh, this, that part of the method and procedure, what I'm doing right now is um, I, I feel like I'm holding a bunch of things together um, that in other audiences, I think I would have trimmed out. 
right? I would have, I would have slimmed that right down and made it into a nice cohesive talk. So uh, with a thesis and an argument, and um, this is all a big lead up to tell you that I have a lot of things to say today, and I'm hoping that they do make sense for everybody because um, they're all up there still. Generally, the theme I want to talk about today is about women and work, but I also want to talk about research uh, methods with written records, how to analyze those records. Um, and I want to do so in, in the project that Suzanne talked about um, earlier with the Nindalok book um, and uh, talk a little bit about where it is right now. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with a story, and this is a, a written record by my great-grandfather, Ian, and my great-grandfather, and uh, Jamie's as well, Scobie Logan, who lived at uh, Muncie, Delaware, um, from like 18, 1850s to the 1920s. Uh, so this is a time before living memory, um, but uh, it doesn't mean that we're not able to kind of make meaning and context out of this. And, and Ian makes meaning out of this letter. I do it a little bit differently. I, I, make, I pull different things out, I think. So Scobie uh, Logan was well-educated. Um, he wrote a lot of letters. He wrote letters to the conservative government. He wrote letters to Indian affairs. Um, his sense of the world was big, I think. His sense of identity and place was strong. So this is a letter he wrote in December, 1885. He's about 37 years old. He's living at Muncie, and he wrote a letter to the Superintendent General of Indian Affairs, um, who is from Manitoba, actually, daily, and uh, telling him he would like to exercise a new section of the Indian Act. He was a person who was well up to date on his Indian Act um, that was passed in the last session of Parliament. In particular, he wanted to use an amendment to the Indian Act that would allow him to lease um, land that he owned at, uh, at uh, Muncie to farmers in the area so that he could generate uh, an income. At the time, he was referring to, uh, it's on this map, you might not be able to see it, but uh, here we are, this is sort of, Muncie, this is the river right here. Um, this is Jubilee Road here. And uh, Rose's house, is right here. <laughs> um, so up three or four, I mean, uh, four lines, I guess, right? Or you know, those are east on the left hand side of this road. This is Tomago Road here. That's the land he's talking about, the one with the green and the red in it, right? That's the north side of that. And it's kind of a weird map because, right? right at the time it's, it was made, which was 1910, uh, was a time period where the, there was a lot of pressure, I think, for, of white settlement around the area. And so there was uh, some issues around struggle for land, uh, what one historian calls compounded uh, dispossession or colonialism um, with the Chippewa, the Thames band and some reclamation of land that Muncie's lived on. So anyway, the, the agreement was he would lease this land, the, the the white farmers, the settler farmer who uh, would take this land and use it, would um, fence it, they would drain it, they would put tiles underneath the ground to drain the, the ground, and they would remove the, the unwanted trees. And, you know, we were talking a little bit about trees at Moraviantown um, earlier. So his justification in this letter that he writes to Indian Affairs, to the superintendent of Indian Affairs, was that um, he was struggling at home. He's, he writes, um, I find it impossible for me to farm or make a living in farming doing, um, owing to my wife having fits. She had epilepsy. I cannot have a hired girl until I have a certain amount of money coming in at certain intervals. I find it very hard to find a girl who will take care of her. Therefore, I have to be around the house all the time. All of... Um, my past savings are gone, and I find this is the only course to keep myself afloat, and owing to the death of my aged father, I find it worse on me, as he used to save her from a great many accidents. So um, Scobie had already spoken to the local Indian agent, told him that he was going to apply for this um, section of the Indian Act to have it applied to his land, um, and he confirmed that he would be sending in the formal application, uh, hoped Indian Affairs would grant his request. 
So it's a pretty small window of, of, a, of a, you know, a month in, in you know, December of 1895. Um, and we can learn a little bit of Scobie's perspective, at least the context of writing for Indian Affairs, um, of his own economic hardship. This kind of hardship led to land leases and surrenders and other places in Ontario and in Canada in order to make ends meet. Uh, and this and had, had the effect of further reducing land holdings for First Nations people and other parts of Canada as well. Because the Indian Act was a Victorian legislation, it almost exclusively referred to Indians as men um, and, and men as active participants in legislation and band governance. So Scobie would have been the one who decided, not his wife, about the land. Um, of course, I, I am interested in the land question, but I'm interested in the land question as it connects to women. I wanna know about women, especially the two that are mentioned in this story. Scobie's wife, Isabel, who could no longer safely be responsible for the house and the family. And I have a picture of the house here. This is it, uh, taken in 1960s. Um, and uh, the hired girl, this unattainable hired girl who, if only Scobie could have had enough steady income, would resolve his financial crisis so that he could go out and farm um, and generate an income uh, either through farming or, or waged work. So uh, in a paper I discussed with the Muncie um, Delaware Language and History Group a few years ago, I reviewed what we could learn about um, Isabel, uh, Scobie's wife, from the records uh, written 10 years uh, before this petition. Um, or no, within, sorry, within 10 years after this petition, um, Scobie had been committed to the London Asylum in Ontario. Um, a process that produced a number of different uh, psych records um, that described Isabel that are, are difficult and, and there's lots of layers and meanings in, in those records um, that, you know, uh, I think we could just come back to them over and over again. Um, a lot of the description about Isabel was actually about her body. Um, and the dangers that epilepsy posed to other bodies, specifically her children and her husband. So I've been also trying to think about how Indigenous bodies were understood in the kind of late 19th and early 20th century as kind of colonized, uh, but also how they're spoken about. So uh, Cody earlier had talked about his grandmother's thick set body. And we've noticed, Ian and I, that um, a lot, there's a lot of talk about our relatives' bodies as well. Our great uncle, Arnold, who served in the, or who, you know, who enlisted, when he enlisted, he was, he was considered the most perfect specimen. Um, Scobie Logan, when he went to the United Kingdom to make a claim for the Muncies um, in Parliament, he was described as square shoulders. And, and as you can imagine, there were a lot of descriptions of uh, Isabel, uh, her body as well. Um, so they're kind of racialized on the one hand. They're also this, this idea of um, this potential for uplift, I think they're discussed like that. Um, so Henry, with Henry's death, Isabel um, and, and, and her commitment to an asylum where she was not the only indigenous woman from the area, uh, this instigated the movement of children um, who were at home, who were living at home, Arnold and Alonzo at least, to the nearby residential school, the Industrial Institute at Mount Elgin. So I want to move back to this hired girl who could have changed the trajectory of all of this. In the context, in this context, hired girls were probably unmarried women, likely around the age of 16 maybe a bit younger, maybe a little bit older. So Scobie was not the only person in the records who identified hired girls this way. Um, I found in another context that in fact, Indian Act legislation about the age at which girls could be discharged or, or both boys and girls could be discharged from residential schools because they legislated that. Um, this changed uh, over time uh, from 16 to 18. And it was because there was a large number of requests from parents to have girls back home to help out if somebody was sick, if there were small children, um, and that you know they, they would um, call for their girls. They would say, I, I would like the girls at home, for example. 
um, and especially when they were nearing or past the age of 16. Uh, so residential school staff, however, uh, would return those letters saying, uh, we want to keep those girls here. They need to have further domestic training so that we can place them in quote unquote private homes, which means homes probably off reserve, right? So we want to keep them at those schools as long as we possibly can so that they can get jobs away from here. If we let them go back to your, um, you know, your reserve, uh, they're going to be in potential peril. They never described exactly what they meant. They say they used euphemisms like, you know what I'm talking about. Um, they needed further moral uplift. They needed the protection that was offered to the school. So, but we know in reality that the, the school, especially Mount Elga and that we're, we're looking at in, in our area, needed the girls at the school because their labor ran the school. They did all of the work to run the school. Um, there wasn't enough funding from the federal government or the United Church of Canada who, who operated that school to cover the bases and girls um, made ends meet basically. So uh, as I've argued elsewhere, uh, women were obviously very highly important to indigenous communities, socially, culturally, economically, and politically at this time in their lives and other points in their lives. In this uh, specific historical context in which like destitute or dislocated households were commonplace, the absence of young women in the home um, constituted a specific and substantial burden on indigenous families. And in the instance of Scobie Logan, there was this absence of women um, and this was making things very difficult for him. Uh, so this gendered experiences of work was a central theme in uh, the book that Suzanne was talking about earlier um, called Ninda Lok, Boys and Girls Work at Mount Elgin um, Industrial School. 1890 to 1915, classic history move there. I did uh, make that periodization there. Um, we did that specifically because we were thinking about the, the kids who were in the area in schools. And in the Ontario school curriculum, that is the era of history that they're, they're looking at, 1890 to 1914, actually. I just added a year. So that, so we wanted this, this book to be specifically history um, curriculum used in that kind of context. It can be used in all kinds of contexts, but uh, Carell had argued earlier that um, it's interesting that, you know, it, it, Indigenous content always gets moved to history. Um, I've experienced the opposite. It's gone out of history. So it becomes Indigenous studies. Um, and then history is told as a story of the Canadian nation and that, you know, Indigenous people kind of moved to an ante room before time. Um, but really, residential schools were very, very central to the formation of the Canadian nation state. It's like absolutely, you know, a great um, showcase of the kind of thinking that was happening um, in, in terms of building the nation in Canada and, and who would be in and out of that nation. Um, so we also wanted to have a local focus on Ontario. Um, in, in terms of residential school education, a lot of the curriculum material actually focuses on Western Canada, where there were quite a few more schools. But in, the, in terms of teaching, uh, I think students uh, get this idea that it happened elsewhere. So presenting a little bit about this book at a community close to, to um, Muncie last year uh, made it very clear to me that they that this was Dutton, Ontario. They didn't know where Muncie was and they didn't know there was a residential school there. So, so this was something in their minds that happened far, far away. Um, and I think it's important because, you know, when we talk about higher, uh, hired girls and women's roles, not only, you know, socially and in a family, but also kind of on economically, we're talking about drawing the labor uh, of women off reserve and onto settler families who um, prosper uh, and, and attain like very wealthy land at this time. Uh, so with those ideas in mind, Julie, uh, my cousin found a grant and that prompted us to study more about the history of Mount Elgin. Um, and uh, we got this grant from the Department of Canadian Heritage, which we've talked a little bit about already. Um, uh, grants, you know, are difficult. They're they're hard. Uh, you get a certain amount of time and a certain amount of money, and we we got it like sort of right at the beginning of the pandemic. So a lot of the research I did was actually online. 
uh, we use kind of self what's called self publishing right it's it's with a press but basically you know they help you with the editorial process and then they just print it for you so it's available on amazon and all kinds of other online book dealers um we use the funds also to uh, cover research um, travel expenses, to commission the work of Muncie artists uh, to use in the book um, for high resolution archival photos. Uh, Ian did the translations for free as he too often does. Um, again, this is an era just outside of living memory. So this means that we relied on our family stories for ins inspiration. So some of those stories are two generations old uh, we also relied on archives. So this is a method that probably is still widely seen as kind of slightly suspicious um, and perhaps less than real history in Canada. Um, so, or, or a different kind of history, I guess. There's a real push uh, right now for the, the, the kind of, I guess, gold standard for residential school history is, is survivor-led uh, research initiatives. Um, and I think that um, residential school um, histories are uh, are kind of dominated by the era of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, and I I really want to kind of add in the dynamic of change over time. Um, Mount Algon was not the same school in 1841 when it opened than it was in 1946 when it closed. Um, gender factored into the experiences of children in a number of ways, um, and we thought that that could be a focus on labor, or uh, uh, sorry, uh, that this focus on labor could bring that out. So uh, we were a little bit concerned because there is a kind of dominant uh, history of residential schools that doesn't talk about labor and really doesn't talk about gender all that much either. So we didn't want to speak over those existing histories, we wanted to think about residential schools as having more than one history, as having histories. Okay, so I went to a bunch of different col uh, what are called colonial archives. So colonial archives are produced and stored in the context of invasion and resettlement of Indigenous territory, and they contain the views of non-Indigenous people who had unprecedented decision-making authority over the lives of First Nations people. So these are, uh, these are you know, archives like our National Archives in Ottawa. Uh, those archives are also, also arranged in ways that justify ongoing colonialism and, and are used in court in ways to justify the Crown's um, ownership of the land uh, of Indigenous people. So, in a way, those archives actually kind of shape your thinking. They mess with your head a little bit. They, uh, they impact the procedures that you take. And that's why meetings like these are so important. Um, yesterday, Velma and Noah mentioned at Fairfield uh, Museum at Moravian Town. She walked in and she saw the ways that um, materials were arranged and they, it felt wrong. It felt really wrong. And it's the same in archives. So in archives, we don't like we don't get to kind of, you know, help to arrange those records in ways that make sense to our survival, right? Um, and so it's a really similar kind of uh, uh, kind of and it's a really great analogy, like going into that museum and, and wanting to change things around to make sense for who you are. <clears throat> Uh, Library and Archives Canada, extremely difficult to get to. It's in Ottawa, it's expensive. Um, <clears throat> I relied on online materials like digital records. So uh, Heritage um, Canadiana, which is an online site that basically digitizes federal records. You can, you can actually request that federal records get digitized and put up on there. Uh, but yeah, there's a, there's also a problem, you know, with these algorithms for searches, you can sometimes reproduce uh, kind of racist uh, ideas about First Nations people, even in the context where you're, you're not wanting that. Um, so there, you know, it, it's, it's good and it's bad. You, you can find all kinds of things like information about uh, the sale of honey and beef that was raised at the school that, you know, like I couldn't find in the Department of Indian Affairs records, for example, they have old old uh, agriculture magazines for that kind of thing. I also went to the United Church of Canada records, which is in Toronto. Again, very hard to work there. They're open from Tuesday to Thursday, 
uh, 10 o'clock in the morning till three. So if you are a person who works full time and you want to see those records, you can't, right? And so also, if you want to go between 10 and three, you have to make an appointment first. So if you show up off, off the street there, they're going to shoo you out. And so like these are these are places that are kind of difficult to, to work in. I also use some records from the NCTR, specifically the ones that um, they have a service whereby you can give a name of a, a family member who went to a residential school and they'll look through their data and try and pull uh, records that um, relate to that family member and send them to you. However, uh, at that time, it was, uh, it was 13 months, I think, since I had requested those records. So if I was a person who was, say, um, a little bit older or you know, less, healthy, um, th that could mean the difference between knowing that uh, those about those records and not. Uh, so these places and their possibilities um, are the center of a course that I'm teaching right now on Indigenous archives uh, to a fabulous class of uh, fourth year undergrads and uh, graduate students at the University of Winnipeg. So we're learning about how difficult it is to, to access archives, but also to think about archives in different ways. There are these ways of information management in Canada, and even like digitally, you know, we save a file within a folder and a folder is within a folder. And like even those structures of information management are, we're, they're, they're ingrained in us. So if we are at the Fairfield Museum, we're thinking this isn't right. How do we redo this? It's very, very difficult to do. Um, and Cody is also teaching a course on Indigenous archives in the spring, and we're hoping to kind of work together and, um, and write a, a paper together for a book on Indigenous archiving uh, in the future. Okay, so a little bit about girls' work at Mount Elgin. Here's Ian's, um, Ian's translation. Kashik Ti Ki Wakwang at the laundry. And um, I'm going to just talk about that one place. So we, when we divided the book up into boys and girls, uh, we also divided it further into places where um, the students worked. And one for the girls was the kitchen, and one another was the laundry. So, um, and the laundry was a a uh, really terrible site of labor at this uh, particular time in history. Um, it, the work was described in the Indian affairs records as arduous, as tiring, as dreadful, as unsafe, and as unsanitary. So they're, the girls here are not just washing the clothes, they're washing all of the bed linens and the other, the other linens that were used in the schools. Um, they are repairing all those clothes as well. They're all those, you know, like basically it's it's a very huge job. Uh, there are between 88 and 110 students at the time period that I'm looking at right there. Um, they uh, had a designated day of the week at this time. It was Mondays. They had a designated space for it, which was called the Laundry and Dry House. It was a two-story brick building. Um, the washing was a very labor-intensive process that at this time in Canadian history, um, like large... Uh, facilities like a residential school would have like um, a laundry service probably or a laundry plant and it would be I would start to be um, uh, you, like steam laundry and um, electrical irons and things like that especially or late 19th early 20th centuries here no we're using um, wooden tubs um, a board a ringer, an iron, a hot water, a steam. So they're bringing hot water into the school at this time. They didn't have plumbing in the building. They're using harsh soap and other uh, cleaning agents. And it wasn't just the, the tools of the trade, it was also the volume. Uh, so these um, items, the, the girls would go around and collect um, in baskets and they'd bring them to one central place for laundering, then they'd fold them, then they'd return them to their place when the job was done. The workday started early with lighting the stoves to heat the water and the irons, and the girls had to haul the water in buckets instead of using taps and um, heat irons on the stove instead of plugging them in so you can see them um, getting warm there. Uh, in warm and dry days, they could put the laundry um, outside to dry. Otherwise, they laid it on racks and radiators in the boys' playroom, in the sewing room, in the dormitories, and in the laundry. 
And this left very little room for children, for the students um, themselves, and it created damp conditions that caused students to get colds and sore throats. Uh, because the work of washing, drying, and putting away clothes and linens at the school was so strenuous, schools relied heavily on the older students to do the bulk of the work. And for them, the work caused exhaustion and made them vulnerable to sickness and sometimes to um, unable to attend class. And staff knew this. Uh, in fact, they planned for students to be exhausted the day after laundry day. And, and this is a quote, unfit for school the next day. So there was lots of appeals from the principal to the federal government to fix the laundry. The laundry is in dreadful condition, wrote one principal. In fact, if any sanitary um, inspector came upon the scene on wash day, we would run serious risk of a report for criminal neglect. It is quite unusual to have a couple of girls in bed for a couple of days after washing. And one mother told me she hadn't the slightest hesitation in saying her girl met her death there. So um, how might a girl meet her death in the laundry? It's, you think, well, cleaning clothes is supposed to be healthy, right? It's supposed to be associated with good health. But the damp and the cramped environment of the laundry and the old equipment that they were using was very hazardous to girls' health, um, as was the heavy nature of the work. They were especially um, girls, this is one of the kind of discoveries that was made in this process. Um, or thinking, I guess, uh, new thinking, uh, is that the girls in particular at those schools were um, exposed to infectious illness um, in ways that boys weren't necessarily. Um, they could be passed through soiled clothing, um, as also bedding, uh, and uh, the girls had to collect, transport, and launder that bedding. Uh, moreover, at the time, the handling of dirty laundry was also associated, uh, associated popularly with the risk of catching tuberculosis, um, as well as the spread of uh, lice, uh, bed bugs, and scabies. So both uh, tuberculosis and parasites were prevalent at Mount Elgin at the time, and a major cause of discomfort, ill health, and even death at the residential school. So I did a little bit of work on the deaths. There's a more intensive work that's being done at Chippewa, the Thames First Nation in Ontario. Um, but I, I kind of cross-referenced what was in the records, what was written about by principals who didn't necessarily do reports, and a lot of the records from that era are gone. Um, but I cross-referenced those with the deaths registered in the um, county of Middlesex um, in the area, and uh, we found, I think, 25. And um, there was... Uh, so, so it's not a per this not perfect statistics, but I was able to confirm the gender of 19 of them, um, the age of six of them, and the cause of death of 20 of those students. So it's not large enough to make a, you know, reliable conclusions. It doesn't include those students who ran away or who were discharged or later died outside of the township, but it does tell us a little bit. Um, for the 23 students, it tells a story about gender. 19 of the students whose gender we knew of that, of that many, six were boys and 13 were girls. Uh, the kinds of work that girls did at Mount Elgin would have been especially, I, can, I think, increasing their risk of not only catching tuberculosis, but also dying of it um, because they would have had weakened immune systems. Um, of the six students whose age could be confirmed, the average age was 14. So the story of student death at Mount Elgin in these years anyway, was a story about teenagers as opposed to young children. Uh, so I know that we're, we're kind of getting close to five here, but I do want to talk a little bit about where the project's at right now. Uh, my beautiful, rule-breaking, tropical fish, unicorn, noble land mermaid cousin, Julie Tucker, <laughs> uh, curated an exhibit at the Art Gallery of uh, Windsor, Ontario. Uh, featuring artists who are descendants of students who attended Mount Elgin. So we asked all of the artists to read the book, to watch a film uh, that was created in 1943 by the United Church of Canada to kind of raise money for its home missions. And we also gave them a, a sketch, a timeline for the school. And uh, we opened the exhibition at the end of September in a really special event 
uh, with most of the uh, artists in the audience and um, the Indigenous community in Windsor as well. And so just at the end, I just want to show you a couple of the, the pieces that, that were produced. This is an early piece by uh, Donna Noah that's in the book. Uh, that piece um, was commissioned and um, it is absolutely stunning. She's a, a beater from Muncie, a Delaware Nation, and um, she, she does these earrings. And if you go to University of Western Ontario, you'll see people all over campus wearing, their, wearing her earrings, so stunning. Uh, this is a really important piece that was done by Jessica Rachel Cook called Under the Blanket. It is uh, an enormous piece that has all kinds of historic um, equipment in it, but also many different layers of interpretation. It's actually can be used as a teaching tool. It takes up a full wall of the, um, of the gallery and is absolutely stunning. Um, and here's a piece by Gig Fisher. That's an early piece that was done for the, um, for the book as well. And uh, by Meg Tucker, uh, a, a portrait of our great uncle, Arnold Logan. And I think that's, oh yeah, we have a, a Vanessa Dion Fletcher's beautiful piece. So this is actually blown up. Her, her piece is about this big and it's um, quill work. Uh, and what they did, they also enlarged it because it's actually on loan now. It's it was purchased, I think, by a bank in Canada, but um, they enlarged it, and the photograph was is so crystal clear. You can you can really see how a uh, quill work is made. It's an, a stunning stunning piece. So I did want to include that too. She's from uh, Moravian Town. Um, so yeah. So I'll I'll end there. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Mary Jane, yeah. um, that was awesome. We have time for a few questions. And um, then at five, we'll take a little short break. Five or just after five, we'll take a little short break before we have the closing forward directions. And Mary Jane will repeat questions that come from the audience so the Zoom can hear. Yeah, are you going to be chairing this? Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Cody. I had a question, and you know, I, I've read obviously your Indigenous Women at Work book, and the last the last chapter talks about as well uh, female historians and the historic profession in Canada and kind of their work. And since you know, the span of your career, I'd be curious the changes you've seen in the realm of Canadian historians in doing sort of this community engaged research because you know you've been at it for. A, a, a nice period of time now where that change has occurred. And just what are some of the biggest differences you've seen just to kind of for the sake of this audience as well? Oh, that is a great question. So did people hear that question okay? Sure, sure. So it's about uh, the changes that I've seen since I wrote a chapter of my thesis, uh, probably in like 2006. Um, and now in terms of, uh, professional historical labor. And um, certainly uh, there, uh, there have been big changes. So at the time uh, there was, I think one uh, woman who was me, who we thought was Métis, uh, who was a historian um, who had worked at the University of Ottawa. And that was the only uh, person who I could find throughout time who was an indigenous person who worked in a history department in Canada. And, um, and then we found out she was not, not Métis. <laughs> so, so that's back down to zero. Uh, so, and that was like 2006. Um, but since then, there have been a number with cross appointments with indigenous studies and history departments um, and, uh, and a number of indigenous people going through these fabulous programs like the one that Cody was in or, and is in it at, um, it's a tri-university program in Southern Ontario. Um, there have been more uh, indigenous people graduating with history degrees and wanting to teach in history departments. That's another thing, because you might get a history degree, but you want it, you're like, that's enough. Thank you, I'll go to indigenous studies, right? So, so I think like my count is like 18 now, <clears throat> but uh, 
but there is still like this idea that there's no indigenous history out there. Uh, and I think you guys get this in teaching too, right? You're like, what do I say? I don't, I don't know what to say, but you could, you know, read and then learn a little bit and, you know, listen to other people. But I think, you know, history professors do that too. And, um, and so like, I, I have, I'm part of this group called Sego Nietzsche, which is, um, it's a website, segonichi.ca, and it's historians, there's six of us. And one of the things I do on there is uh, on our Indigenous History Month, our month is in June, but uh, I post um, biographies of working Indigenous historians. And it's a way, it's, it's really meant for, the, for Indigenous professors out there who say, well, there's, there's no Indigenous historians that I can refer to so I can just pull on my own knowledge or, or, or exclude that part of my, you know, of my course. So, um, so I think there's still a need for that. And, and like people find it and they're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe there's this many Indigenous historians. So I still think that there's a big, that there's maybe a little bit of prejudice around Indigenous historians, maybe not being objective enough, maybe not being well-trained enough in the kind of like methods of history, the, the appropriate methods of history. And so, that like people tend to kind of still refer to indigenous people as them as opposed to us as you know as their instead of our it's still you know it's still a struggle in the Canadian history profession for sure yeah. mm -hmm. Well, I, I would like to come back to what you said at the beginning that you're working together here with the medieval historian. I'm a medieval historian as well, but, uh, from from Europe, and I do European medieval history, and we have sometimes a similar problem in terms of the archive. Because our archives are shaped by national historiographies of the 19th century, and we have to deconstruct it very, very carefully as well. So I, I, I wondered in your cooperation with a medieval historian, how did you experience the, the exchange? Yeah, the exchange is fantastic. And what I love most about it is no one's no one's worried about that here, right? Like the ideas that we're coming here with our own kind of set of knowledge, and we're gonna learn about things that we don't know anything about. And that's not um something to be afraid of or uh you know that will make you appear weak or something right the expertise is is kind of in the collective i think so it's yeah it's really different say than than a lot of the kind of professional uh like canadian historical association is changing but it, it used to be a little bit more um frightening and trying to prove yourself and and people will try and find holes in your story and um and challenge you and, and want you to tell them something else than what you said <laughs> And I don't, I don't find that here at all. So it, it is, it's a very special kind of way of doing history that I really appreciate. And, and that probably has picked up since 2006. Although there were places where we could do this even then, I think. But some people don't have that, right? So, yeah. mm -hmm. A couple of people in the chat were asking if you could uh, spell the website name for the Indigenous authors and historians. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to do this wrong and some Mohawks are going to get mad. S-H-E-K-O-N. -E, it's like Sego Nietzsche, so that N starts Nietzsche to N-E-E-C-H-I-E -E -E dot C-A. S-H-E-K-O-N-E-E-C-H-I-E -E -E dot C-A. And you can blame Alan Corbier for that. <laughs> so he, he pulled it from, um, from a conversation between uh, a soldier and an officer in uh, the War of 1812, where the officer is kind of saying, I, I, like, I find if you say Sego Nietzsche, you can cover all the, all the Native people. You, you can, they'll all know who, what you're saying. <laughs> so, so somehow that became the, the website. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have my hand up. I was just. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the work that you and Cody are doing to help students working in archives. And as an archivist, I was wondering if you could talk about what could be helpful for archivists looking to help other people work with, you know, not just indigenous peoples, but people that are seeking out their genealogies, that are seeking out these histories. How can we be helpful in these big bureaucratic structures? Um, yeah, what, what can we do to, to help support this work? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's a really good question. So, oh yeah, what can archivists who are working in various archives, most of them colonial, I mean, I think the NCTR in Canada would be the, the, the one archive that people point to as being perhaps like on the precipice of becoming an indigenous archive, right? But, uh, you know, from most part, they're colonial archives. What can people who work there do? And um, yeah, like what, it's um, the course that we do is we, we basically for the first eight weeks, we take students to archives and we introduce them to the arrangement system and, and get them to think critically about it. Um, so that they can themselves think about how that arrangement structure affects their, their own thinking and maybe um, the ways that they can and can't help uh, in terms of Indigenous historical research. Another big thing is advocacy for Indigenous research. And I think LAC is still kind of like a little bit unclear about, about that. I think they want to have, <laughs> uh, you know, a really objective kind of relationship with Indigenous people, but archivists can advocate for indigenous people doing research and you do that by by maintaining hours that are going to be available um, by by helping people uh, think through records where i do a, a project that's on uh, tuberculosis history in manitoba and the access to those uh, medical records is very very difficult uh, in the states it's a little bit different but in the province of manitoba uh, health records are closed forever you can never gain access to them, especially except through a, a particular kind of like punitive research agreement. And um, that does not allow you to share any information with the people who most need it and are asking for it. So we get a lot of questions from people saying, I, you know, I lost uh, a mother in 1956. Do you know where she's buried? And we can't do that. So what we did was we created a research guide with the help of archivists. To, uh, to help people learn how to do that research themselves. We also went to archives with the help of archivists to do video modules about what an archives is like, how to get in, you know, what times you can come, what your expectations are if you have to sign in. We have these archives that are like um, guarded by, you know, security and they have to sign in with ID and it's kind of this crazy process. So we have people help out with that. With that, they can get around those rules in some cases. Um, so, but you know, another thing is, I think it's really important is that uh, that there are indigenous archivists um, and there are indigenous people talking about archives too. So, uh, so I think it's not, uh, I just don't wanna make a place where there's no place for indigenous historians and archives to talk about archives. Uh, that can be done by, by the archivists themselves, right? That's, that's okay, we've got everything, right? If you think of yourself as being part of this relationship building, there's always something that that can be learned and exchanged and a role for Indigenous people in those places. So, yeah. And then Cody, like Cody's got a totally different course. It's it's so interesting how we're, we've got a huge, hugely different uh, approach. I'm in Winnipeg. Um, I'm in where the Hudson's Bay Company archives, a huge, you know, like you guys know this because you're medievalists, right? This huge corporation, that a 400-year-old corporation in, in, um, in Canada and, and Britain, and all of its records. And um, they are all organized for the business uh, and for creating money for um, London, uh, England, and, and the traders, right? So a part of the, a, a huge building, um, the Bay Building, which is, the, there's a, there are these uh, department stores across Canada, right? The old department store was created in 1920 in, in, in uh, Winnipeg, it's a big site downtown. It was just sold to the Southern Chiefs Organization in Manitoba for a dollar. So they now own it, they're making housing, they're making an archives, a museum in there. And so what the students in the classroom have to do is kind of think about, think through that process, what would it mean to bring some of those archives from the Hudson's Bay Company into the context of a modern um, First Nations political organization with goals of its own, right? How would you rearrange those records? And yeah, it's going to be it's it's going to be really really interesting. That's their that's their assignment. They don't have an essay. That's their they have to kind of make a pitch to the Southern Chiefs organization of how they might rearrange their records. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. What do you think is the best way to incorporate um, oral histories and stories passed down 
and map that or match that with this uh, maybe more traditional historical research and how is that viewed by the wider community? Yeah, so this is about using uh, both oral history research and archival research. And um, I don't have a problem with doing that. I find I'm I'm actually also bringing living people into, into that process. So I'll say to Ian, did you know this? Did you see this from this um, oral history? A lot of those oral histories are now transcribed and searchable now. So we can use old, old uh, oral histories from the 80s, um, listen to them, listen to them again, listen to them again. Every time you listen to them, you pick up something different with an oral history, I find. Um, and triangulate them and you can fit them and they'll make you ask questions of the records and then they'll, they'll make you ask questions of people who might have known the person who was doing the oral history like I think of them as very much related I, you know, for a while in history, they were seen as separate and kind of competitive resources. Um, but I don't, yeah, I, I just can't like me I, I looked at um, the history of, of nursing right and like I could never do strictly archival research with that there's it just doesn't it doesn't mean anything I think um, when you do it that way it's always kind of a little bit of back and forth but yeah I think there's a little bit more um, understanding for that like yeah yeah it's difficult because uh, like historians sometimes will keep their oral histories and not share them they, they don't get archived right so again you gotta you gotta share those oral histories they're not they're not for just you I think I am. I'm just going to thank you again to Mary Jane, and I'm going to say thank you to our Zoom audience. We're yes. going to close down the Zoom the, so that the closing session that'll start in five minutes can be a little bit more intimate and a little bit more um, focused on the, the group that's here. And I just want us to thank Mary Jane one more time for a wonderful lecture.